Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. It's not beginning to look and feel a lot like Christmas. Winter warmth. We're looking for any signs of the white stuff for Christmas. We'll see. Big news for drivers of I-75. As they say, 2019 was a struggle, but in 2020, we get a reprieve. Mayhem on I-94. Detroit police respond tonight after video emerges of people shutting down the freeway to do donuts. Yeah, and Detroit police respond tonight after video emerging of people, as you just saw there in that video. Thanks for being with us for the news at five. Yeah, for the second time this year now, rogue drivers commandeer a Metro Detroit freeway to burn rubber and then they post it on the Internet. Detroit Police Chief James Craig says his officers are on the job and he has a simple message. He says they will be caught. Rod Maloney is live at I-94 in Trumbull where it all happened this weekend. Rod, good evening. Good evening. It's that dangerous confluence of social media and joyriding, but conducted down here at Rosa Parks and I-94 West. They left those donuts. They left the rubber there on the highway and taunted DPD all the while. It's as audacious as it is dangerous, which is, of course, the point. An adrenaline high, not only for the driver spinning and spending his tires so fast that the car leaves donuts on the pavement, but also the camera phone operator. And Detroit Police Chief James Craig puts it more bluntly. Not one of them can drive. They're not professional race car drivers. We on 94 with it, baby! For the second time in 2019, the loosely organized group pulled together a number of cars to block traffic for about 10 to 15 minutes on I-94 West so that the tricked out and hopped up orange Camaro could do repeated circular drifts and did so in three different sections of the highway over about a half mile, still visible today. The tweak to the police is a covered license plate with a vulgar message to DPD that's blurred out in the video. Chief Craig says they've already made an arrest of someone who was there last night but didn't drive. He's charged with hitting a pedestrian with his car in another similarly dangerous event last month in Detroit. During that activity, he struck a pedestrian. That pedestrian is in critical condition, uh, still recovering uh, in a local hospital. The chief worries these cars with as much as 750 horsepower could possibly go airborne into the opposing lane. It's not exciting. It's very dangerous. It's a public safety disaster waiting to happen. Now, the chief says that they do have a lead on the guy driving the Camaro. They don't know quite yet who he is, but they believe he lives outside of the city of Detroit. And that really galled the chief because he says you're not just going to come into the city of Detroit and think that you can do this and get away with it. He says they will be caught and they're on the case. Back to you. Yeah, and Rod, I'm wondering if and when DPD makes an arrest, what will happen uh -huh. and, and what will become of that car? Well, interesting you ask, because in the case where this guy that got arrested last night is charged with felonies, uh, he was a passenger in a car that did a 360 and hit someone. So they impounded the car, but he got the car back because he wasn't driving. But the chief says when they get a hold of this Camaro, he says they're going to seize it and turn it into a police car. We'll keep following it. All right, Rod, thanks. Twas the night before the night before Christmas and <laughs> man sure doesn't feel like it outside a lot of folks outdoors today enjoying warm weather and from the looks of it this warm weather might just stick around for a while. Yeah, how about that? Let's get over to Brandon. He's in for Ben tonight. It's definitely good traveling weather. Beautiful travel shopping weather. No doubt we had 54 earlier today record on this day. The 23rd of December for Detroit is 59. So we were five degrees from a record and 20 degrees above average or normal. We should have been in the middle 30s today. We're still at 48 at Metro, 46 for you at Ann Arbor. You can see there's a little bit of a breeze, so the wind chill down a couple, two, three degrees from the air temperature. But again, traveling, shopping, whatever you have going on this evening, Hanukkah plans being out and about. We have middle 40s over the next uh, 
uh, 90 minutes or so, and then dropping eventually into those 30s as is sort of per usual or normal. So nothing outrageous as far as a cool down, but a little bit of cloud cover and a dry cold front. We'll explain how those will impact your Christmas Eve coming up. All right, Brandon, tonight a 75 year old man has been formally charged in the fatal shooting of his neighbor in Warren. 53 year old Cindy Poff was killed Sunday morning at the Williamsburg East Apartments there on Shaner. Just a short time ago, her neighbor, Richard Mazka, was formally charged with her murder. Victor Williams is following this for us tonight. Victor, I understand they had a history of arguments. Yes, that's what we're being told, but the victim was shot right here at this apartment complex execution style, and the person who's accused of pulling the trigger suddenly had a case of amnesia in the courtroom. The government's accusing you of being in the city of Warren on or about December 22nd, 2019. 75-year-old Richard Maxa answered to a judge Monday morning for allegedly shooting and killing his longtime neighbor at this Warren apartment complex Sunday morning. Do you understand the possible penalties? No, I don't. I wasn't there at the time. I don't know that lady. But Maxa seemed to have an issue with his memory, not able to recall any of what happened. Do you understand the four charges you're being accused of? Uh, no, Your Honor. Who was I supposed to assault? Leslie Heron. <coughs> Do you understand Never the heard. charges now? Not that one. The 75-year-old is facing four separate criminal offenses, including homicide, felony firearm, and assault with a dangerous weapon. Yet the defendant is worried about other things when speaking to the judge, who's growingly becoming annoyed in the courtroom. You see that I get my, my medicine here, uh, my asthma medicine? Okay, I can't help you with that, sir. The defendant is even muted, making one last plea before being taken away. Good luck, uh, sir. Again, I don't know... Even cooking. Thank you, sir. Now, Maxa is due back in court on January the 9th. In the meantime, his bond is set for $500,000. Reporting live in Warren, Victor Williams, Local 4. A mother and a boyfriend arrested after a two-year-old boy is found beaten and not breathing. The couple faced a judge this afternoon. 19-year-old Jayla Phillips is charged with child abuse. 22-year-old Cody Eagle is charged with resisting and obstructing an officer. Prosecutors call Eagle a person of interest in the abuse of the two-year-old. Both were arrested Sunday in Monroe and pleaded not guilty to charges. Prosecutors say the child remains in critical condition. Uh, the two-year-old child in this matter has suffered very severe injuries, is currently in the ICU in critical condition at um, the Toledo Hospital. And all of these injuries were alleged to have occurred while this child was in the care of his mother. Phillips was given a $250,000 bond. Eagle was given $100,000. Both will be back in court next week. From the looks of it, MDOT has quite a Christmas gift to tens of thousands of commuters who take I-75 through Oakland County. MDOT says both sides will reopen to traffic by New Year's Eve. Jamie Edmonds is live along the I-75 corridor. Jamie, it does look like there still might be a lot of work to be done. That's right, there's still plenty of work to be done. You have to rebuild all of those southbound lanes, eight and a half miles of it, but at least we get a winter reprieve. Segment two of the I-75 modernization project has been challenging, shall we say. It's a mess. Total mess. Total mess. Nightmare. Nightmare. My commute that's normally like 20 minutes in the morning is probably more like 40, 45 in the morning and the evening. But there is some good news for drivers. MDOT is playing Santa and delivering a Christmas gift. Get northbound over on the northbound side, southbound, use the southbound side, get it back to what most people would consider normal. Crews have spent 2019 rebuilding the northbound lanes and replacing 11 bridges from 13 mile to Coolidge Highway. Starting Friday morning, they will begin the process of moving northbound traffic onto the new pavement. 
but it will take some time to get the southbound lanes back to normal. It's about nine miles of concrete barrier that has to be moved. Um, get the southbound side restriped so the lanes are back in their normal configuration like before construction started. MDOT expects traffic to flow in both directions freely by New Year's Eve. The drivers we talked to were thrilled with this news. That's that is a break. That's nice. That that that's a lot less stress on me on a daily basis now. You want to say thank you, M. Dot. Thank you, M. Dot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, drivers are pretty excited. This is just for the winter months. Come spring, we do this all over again when both directions will be in the northbound lanes while crews rebuild those southbound lanes. MDOT saying they're doing this now because they can't do much work during the winter and it's safer for snow removal. We're live in Madison Heights. Jamie Edmonds, Local 4. Jamie, it sounds like there might be one little but wait in the story. On the northbound side, is there still some construction going to happen there? That's right. Don't everyone freak out. You will see some <laughs> construction from Big Beaver to Waddles. They're building a noise wall, so one lane will be down just in that direction. All right, that's not bad, though. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, it was pretty bad this morning in US 23 in Livingston County. It has reopened now after a very serious accident this morning. Sky 4 shows you the scene in Green Oak Township between Lee and Silver Lake Road. Crews worked to clear the scene for several hours. We're working to learn if anyone was injured. More testing shows drinking water is safe after a seawall collapse on the Detroit River. The Great Lakes Water Authority tested water at the source and tested tap water as well. The test for metals, including uranium, came back non-detectable or levels that are under the EPA guideline. The Great Lakes Water Authority says it will release test results for radioactive forms of elements when it gets those results.